Teal there. I've often spoken about genetic links and biological bases for behaviours that humans exhibit. Indeed, it's such a major facet of human behaviour that it often bleeds into some of my videos that aren't even specifically about the topic, especially in the current year where literally everything is just a social construct, and the FemSoc Just Brigade seem to think that everything can be explained with interpretivist methodology and just asserting that everything that you are is constructed by society, and that there couldn't possibly be any genetic influence in there whatsoever, which is of course absolute nonsense. And on some of the more in-depth videos that I've done, specifically the ones talking about the bogus accusation of genetic determinism, when we talk about genetic influences on behaviour and how genes and environment constantly interact with each other to produce the overall patterns that we see in society, some people have asked me, are there any other behavioural traits which can be explained, at least partly, by genes? And the answer is yes. So let's resurrect the concept of the video series, A Biological Reason, and start it off with something really rather interesting. The heritability of food neophobia. Might sound a little bit unusual and perhaps a little intimidating, but it really isn't. It just means, is there a heritable genetic cause for children being fussy eaters? and not wanting to eat certain kinds of food, especially new kinds of food, things that they've never been exposed to before. Now, this is something which has been quite well documented, but a lot of the studies which go around looking at neophobia tend to focus on adults or teenagers and somewhat older children, usually seven plus. So I've dug up a study which looks at far younger children here, specifically this one. Child food neophobia is heritable, associated with less compliant eating, and moderates familial resemblance for BMI. This was posted in Pediatric Obesity back in 2013, and at the time was the first study of its kind that was looking at quite young children, because the youngest that they were using was four years old, and went up to seven. And obviously the advantage of using younger children when you're attempting to establish genetic links to certain behaviours is that you're catching them earlier and earlier and earlier in the process of socialisation, which basically means you're reducing the amount of time any sort of social impact could have had on the exhibition of that behaviour. This is why studies that look at toy preference in children, and you're looking at children six months old or younger, are so important to disproving the society conditions you to be male or female rhetoric, because these experiments are conducted in the pre-socialization stage. So now we're going to dive on in there and start seeing what some of this research turned up. The researchers do start by noting that family factors do appear to be critical to the development of food neophobia. Parents do, after all, shape the home food environment and child food preferences, because ultimately they do control what food is in the environment for the child to eat, and that this may be true for food neophobia as well. Indeed, it's often been noted that parents who consumed a wider variety of foods had children who were less neophobic, and that children's apprehension about trying new foods has been reduced by increasing the availability of different kinds of food at home and by parents tasting these items themselves, which is the pattern of behaviour specifically where you as a parent actually sit down and eat with your child. Something which is very important, not only in helping develop your child's diet, but in developing their social skills as well, and something which seems to be increasingly less common in modern times. The authors note that multiple studies have shown that food neophobia is familial, which may reflect similarities in home environment. For example, there was a study of 81 sibling pairs, all of whom aged 5 to 11, which found a fairly significant mother-child correlation. A follow-up study also found significant correlation among mothers and their 7-year-old daughters, and another indicating that there was decent parent-child correlation for food neophobia in 9 to 11-year-olds. And then there was a really big experiment done in Sweden, 722 families, that reported food neophobia scores were correlated among mothers and children at the ages of 11, 13, 15, and 17. So as you can see, we've got a lot of evidence that this pattern of behaviour exists, and there absolutely is correlation between parents and children. However, while families 
do have a lot of home influence with each other because they're all in the same environment, they also share quite a lot of genetic information as well. So this correlation of this behavior between parents and children has been noted. But can we now begin to work out how much of this is environmental and how much of it is genetic? Well, yes we can. Cook et al, for example, did a study on food neophobia in 8 to 11 year old twins. Results indicated that 78% of the variance in parent reported food neophobia was because of additive genetic factors, with the remaining variance attributed to non-shared environmental factors. There was also a twin study done in Finnish adults which found that 69% of the variance in reported food neophobia was because of genetic factors. So we've got some pretty good ballpark estimates from a couple of other studies here as well. Somewhere around 70 to 80% of the exhibition of this behavior is down to some sort of genetic influence. So let's dig on into this particular study a little bit more, shall we? 66 same-sex twin pairs were used, aged between 4 and 7. Only same-sex twin pairs were recruited, and they were all in good health, had no major health problems, food allergies, or anything that would stop them participating. Of these 66 pairs, 37 of them were monozygotic twins, and 29 of them were dizygotic. That just means that 37 of them were identical twins, and 29 of them were non-identical. This was determined by looking for certain genetic markers obtained from cheek cells using a swab. The behavioral patterns were determined by a lengthy series of questions, including questionnaires around child feeding, parental demand and pressure on the child to eat certain kinds of food, how often the child and how likely the child is to refuse certain things, what you're feeding them, when you're feeding them, how much choice the child has, so on and so forth. So once all of this data has been gathered, it then has to be analyzed. Now there's a good part of this which is only really relevant for the researchers, but I'll list off the important parts for you to know about right here. Biometric analyses tested the goodness of fit of five competing models that fit the following parameters in different combinations. Additive genetic influences, A, referring to multiple alleles that work additively to impact the trait. Dominant genetic influences, D, referring to multiple alleles at the same genetic locus that work interactively to impact the trait. Shared environmental influences, C, and non-shared environmental influences, E. The five competing biometrical models were 1, ACE, 2, ADE, 3, AE, 4, CE, and 5, E. And these five models are typically fit and tested in behavioral genetic studies as described in Neil and Kahn's classic text. Now there is more to this, but this is kind of the most important part. The rest of the analysis of the data is just ensuring that what you've gathered actually works and can fit into those models. So the reason that you're looking across all of these five models, which are all calculating all of these different variables together, is that once you've gathered all of the data around what genes the child has and what behavioral patterns the child is exhibiting, all of which you got from the swabs and then the questionnaires respectively, you can basically take all of that information and put them into different formula, and by adding or removing certain variables, you can work out how much of an influence each one of those variables has on your total. That's basically the quickest, easiest, and dirtiest way of explaining it. And when you do all of this maths, you end up with a results table that looks something like this. And the most important numbers that you've got here is the ACE, AD, and AE model and then the A and the D values. So you'll remember that the D value was dominant genetic influence, and that accounted for 72% of the food neophobia trait in these children. And then considering the A value, which was the additive genetic influence, and this study found that to be 69%, which was in line with those ballpark figures that we got from the previous studies at the start of the video. So what did the researchers have to say about this finding? The main finding of this study is that genes play a substantial role in young children's tendencies to avoid new foods, accounting for 72% of the variance in this trait. The heritability estimate is comparable to those reported for 8 to 11 year old children, 78%, and adults, 69%. These studies also reported a significant dominant genetic effect. Thus, the magnitude of genetic influence appears to be constant across the developmental spectrum. Genes also influence children's propensity to eat in the absence of hunger and eat in response to external food cues and internal satiety signals, as well as 24-hour dietary patterns. 
Thus, genes appear to influence a range of eating patterns that emerge during childhood. Regarding environmental influences, food near phobia, we found that unique life experiences that are not shared by siblings make children differ in this trait. Thus, parents' greatest influence on children's food near phobia may reside in how they treat their children differently rather than similarly, which is typical of child development. Child-specific environments can include parental feeding practices or food exposures, which may differ among siblings, as well as social factors out of the home. Peers have a powerful influence on child development, including eating behavior. Experiences that promote and protect against food neophobia need to be identified, most interestingly, among siblings residing in the same household. So there's just some interesting things to consider there. It would appear that if your child is a fussy eater, there's actually a very good chance that it's something that is simply in their genes. Now, that's not to say that there's absolutely nothing you can do about it, because, as we all know, genetics is not destiny. It simply makes certain patterns of behavior more likely to manifest. But crucially, once you identify that pattern of behavior, it means that you can start coming up with more effective strategies of combating them. Should that be your choice, of course. Which, if you've got a child who's refusing to eat their broccoli, it's probably quite high on your list to deal with that. So if you've got a child who's refusing to eat their veggies, you don't need to feel bad or think that you failed in raising your child right. It's more than likely just a behavioral pattern that they are more prone towards taking. But once you know this, it does mean that you can start coming up with effective strategies to deal with it. Even this paper suggests that efforts to reduce food neophobia within the family may need to be individualized or tailored to each child, taking their idiosyncrasies into consideration rather than treating all children the same. Certain food exposure strategies might help increase acceptance for one sibling, such as role modeling by parents at the dinner table, whereas alternate strategies might work better for other siblings, like providing novel foods as snacks while reading, Exposure is an effective strategy for combating food neophobia. So, there you have it. Fussy eating in children, largely influenced by genetics, but there are, of course, environmental and social effects as well. As with pretty much every faculty of human behavior, it's not nature versus nurture, it's nature and nurture, and how much of one or the other. In this particular instance, it seems to be largely genetic, so getting your kids to eat their greens might seem like a bit of an uphill struggle, but hopefully with a little bit more information on your side, it might make that struggle seem a little bit less arduous.